we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. We saw the necessity of a new school. The meaning of the word school means leisure, leisure in which to learn, and a place where students and teachers can flower as human beings, without fear, without confusion, with great integrity. Hello and welcome to episode 151 of Urgency of Change. This week's theme is Krishnamurti Schools. Each episode of the Krishnamurti podcast is compiled from carefully chosen extracts from our archives, representing Krishnamurti's different approaches to fundamental issues we all face in our lives. Upcoming topics are doubt, reincarnation and unity. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Please visit the official YouTube channel for hundreds of advert-free, full-length video and audio recordings of Krishnamurti's talks. In addition, the Foundation's own channel features hundreds of specially selected clips. You can also find our regular quotes and videos on Instagram, TikTok and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, which helps our visibility. This week's episode on Krishnamurti Schools has six sections. This first extract is from the first question and answer meeting at Brockwood Park in 1980, titled, Why do you have schools and foundations? You have spoken so much against organisations, So why do you have schools and foundations? And why do you speak? Did I answer this question? Yes? Bene. I think a group of us saw the necessity of having a school. School, the meaning of that word school means leisure. Leisure in which to learn. And a place where students and the teachers can flower. And a place where a future generation can be prepared. Because schools are meant for that, not just merely to turn out human beings to mechanical, technological instruments, merely jobs and careers and so on, which is necessary, but also flower as human beings without fear, without confusion, with great integrity. And to bring about such a good human being, I'm using the word good in its proper sense, not in the respectable sense, good in the sense a whole human being, not fragmented, not broken up, not confused. And it is very difficult to find teachers who are also inclined that way. 
And as you know, as one is aware, the teachers are the lowest paid, without the least respect by society, and so on. So we are trying both in India, where there are nearly six schools, in California and Canada, one here, to see that there are really a centres of understanding, of comprehension of life, not books only. And we thought it is such a place is necessary. And that's why we have these schools. They may not always succeed, but perhaps one or two after ten years might come out of it as total human beings. And the foundations in California, in America, in India, here, in other places, Canada, are mere exist not to as centres of enlightenment and all that business, but merely to publish books, to organise these gatherings, to help the schools, and so on. And nobody is making any profit out of it. Right? And why do I speak? This has been often asked. Why do you waste your energy after 60 years and nobody seems to change? Why do you bother about it? Is it a form of self-fulfilment? Do you understand my question? Is it a form of where you get energy talking about things, so you depend on the audience? We've been all through all that several times. First of all, I don't depend on you as an or as a group who come to listen to the speaker. I have been silent, the speaker has been silent, so I can... uh, you can be rest assured that the speaker is not exploiting you, is not attached to a particular group or see necessary for him to have a gathering. But then why do you speak? What is your motive? Right? There is no motive. I think when one sees something beautiful, true, One wants to tell people about it, out of affection, out of compassion, out of love. And if those who are not interested in it, it's all right. Those who are interested, perhaps, can gather together. And it's also, can you ask the flower why it grows? why it has perfume, and it's for the same reason the speaker talks. The second extract is from the first question and answer meeting at Brockwood Park in 1981, titled Do your schools create an elite atmosphere? You often said that no one can show the way to truth, yet your schools are said to help their members to understand themselves. Is this not a contradiction? Does it not create an elite atmosphere? My gosh! 
The speaker has said that there is no path to truth, that no one can lead another to it. He has repeated this very often for the last sixty years. That's what the speaker has said. And the speaker, with the help of the others, have founded several schools in India, here, and so on. And the questioner says, Are you not contradicting yourself when the teachers and the students in all these schools are trying to understand their own conditioning? educating themselves not only academically, as well as possible, but also educating themselves to understand their whole conditioning, their whole nature and the whole psyche of those people in the schools. I don't, one doesn't quite see the contradiction. Schools, from the ancient Greek to ancient India and so on, are places where you learn. Learn where there is leisure. Please go with me a little bit. One cannot learn if you have not leisure. That is, time to yourself, time to listen to others, time to inquire. Such a place is a school. The modern schools all over the world are are merely cultivating one part of the brain, which is the acquisition of knowledge, technologically, scientifically, biologically, archaeology and so on. They are only concerned with the cultivation of a particular part of the brain which acquires a great deal of knowledge, outer knowledge, astrophysics, theoretical physics, architecture, engineering and so on, surgery, medicine. So they are cultivating, only as far as one can see, knowledge. That knowledge can be used skillfully to earn a livelihood or unskillfully, depending on the person. The schools, such schools have existed for thousands of years. Here in these schools, we are trying something entirely different. You don't mind my telling you all this? Are you interested in this? Not very much, but all right. (laughs) Here we are trying not only to educate academically A-levels and O-levels and all the rest of it, but also to cultivate, to understand, to educate, to inquire into the whole psychological structure of human being. Students come already conditioned, So there begins the difficulty. One has not only to help each other to uncondition, but also to inquire much more deeply. This is what these schools with which we are connected are trying to do. They may not succeed. Probably they won't. Or probably they will. But as it is a difficult task, one must attempt it, not always follow the easiest path. This is a difficult 
subject to go into, but it does not create an elite. What is wrong with being, have, being an elite? What's wrong with it? Do we want everybody and everything to be pulled down to the common denominator? That's one of the troubles of so-called democracy, which has been a problem in India, where I won't go into all that. Just me. <laughs> so there is no contradiction, as far as one can see. Contradiction exists only. When you assert something and contradict it at another time. But here we are saying that no one can lead you to truth, to illumination, to the right kind of meditation, to right behaviour. No one. Because you, are, you, each one of us, is responsible for himself, not depending at all on anybody. And we are trying, in all these schools in India, here and so on, to cultivate a mind, a brain, that is holistic. Not just knowledge, per se, for action in the world, but not to neglect the psychological nature of man, because that is far more important than the academic career one must have in the present world, in the present civilization, whatever that civilization is. They must have the capacity to earn a livelihood, and apparently a certain kind of education is necessary. And most schools in the West and in the East are neglecting the other side, which is far deeper and greater. And here we are trying to do that. We may succeed. We hope we do, but we may also not. <coughs> but we are doing something that is not done in other schools. It doesn't mean we are the only school, but we are trying to do it. There is no contradiction. The third extract is from the third question and answer meeting in Ojai, 1982, titled Why do people object to Krishnamurti schools? How do you feel about one million dollars going to educate a small, somewhat select group of children that do not appear to be from the suffering or destitute? What do you think? This school, Oak Grove School, as far as I understand, has a scholarship fund for poorer people, for the so-called destitute, for children who are not from the well-to-do class. I wonder why there is a general antagonism or feeling against a group of people who are elite, and why do we object to a school of this kind which has really a scholarship? Why do you object to it? 
not knowing all the intricacies of the school, the problems of the school, and so on. And why don't you, if I may point out, object to the enormous sums of money being spent on war? Why don't you object to that? War, not in a particular war, nuclear war, but the whole idea of killing people for one's country. Why do, isn't that much more important to object to that than to this? This is also important, and we have replied to it. That is, this school, Oak Grove School, they are spending your money, a million dollars, if they can get it. I think they will get at least half of it. Having a secondary school. And there is a scholarship fund for those who cannot possibly afford the full pay. If you feel this strongly, then what will you do about it? burn up the place, or go into the question, why in an affluent society as in America, as in this country, as in this part of the world, why there are people who are starving, who are very little, who are uneducated, who are submit to, submitting to all kinds of horrors. Why this country is spending millions and millions and millions in armament and so on? Why? Do we object merely verbally? Or do we take action about all this? And what can one do when a country, like all over the world, even the most primitive societies in the, in the world, are accumulating materials for war? Each country, like France, England, America, and other countries are spending, are selling armaments to other countries, poorer countries, who are also spending millions on all kinds of horrible means of destruction of humanity. What do, what do we feel about all this? And what can one do about all this? It seems almost impossible to stop this destruction of man. So do we go to the root of all this, or merely consider not to have certain type of nuclear bombs and so on, superficially? Or do we go into all these matters deeply? That is the core, what is the cause of all this? What's the cause of poverty, not only in this country, which is so affluent compared to the rest of the world, What do we do about it? When you go to the Asiatic world, India and so on, the population is increasing every year. In India, 15 or 13 million people are added every year. And a very, very poor country like that is spending billions on armaments. 
buying Mirage from France to oppose another country neighbour. We are all doing this. What shall we do? What is the cause of all this? Destitution, poverty, orphans. In the Asiatic world, people have starved, are starving. The speaker was part of it. Not enough food, and so on. As a boy, as a child. So we all know what poverty is. Perhaps not you. I'm glad you don't know it. And what is the core? What is the root of all this? Is it national pride? Is it some kind of peculiar honour to fight for one's own country and kill millions of people in that for that honour? What is the cause of this destitution, the increasing poverty in the world? Is it that the nationalism has divided people, and therefore one country is enormously well-to-do, the other countries are not? Is it possible to have a global relationship, interrelationship, so that economically, socially, as politics, everything is a global problem, not American problem, an Asiatic problem. Can we consider that to stop wars which is part of destitution, part of this enormous destruction of another human being, who is like you. You may call himself a Turk, or an Argentine, or a British, or a Russian, but that human being is like you and me, going through all kinds of misery, hoping for security in nationalism, which is isolation. And in that isolation there is no security. So could we, or some group of people, be free of all nationalism? who are absolutely, totally against war, killing other human beings. I'm not telling you to do it, please. There were in ancient societies a group of people who refused to kill under all circumstances. It was their religious deep conviction that to kill was evil, and if you kill you would pay for it next life. Therefore don't kill. Reward and punishment, maybe. But the idea of killing something, because life is sacred. So how? If one feels that deeply, one puts aside all tribalism and 
can governments in the world pro- not accumulate armaments? Seems almost impossible. The world has gone insane. If you don't pay tax, you are sent to prison because you are an objector to all this. And if you buy a stamp, you are sustaining war. If you pay for petrol or gas, it's called in this country. Part of it goes to war. So, seeing all this, what is the what is a human being to do? Not only in this school. That's a small affair. What is a human being? Confronting with all these problems, what is he to do? Who is responsible for all this? Governments? Politicians? The group of terribly rich people who are controlling governments, big corporations. Who is responsible for all this? Horror. Please answer these questions. Isn't each one of us responsible? Because we dislike or a foreigner. Hate people who are not of the same colour as we are. And so on to each one of us. Isn't each one of us responsible for all this? So if we are responsible It's our duty, our our intense feeling that will bring about a new society, a new group of people. That's the function of education. At least we we are trying in the school to bring about good human beings. Whether they are rich or poor, that is, children or children. Good, integrated, honest human beings. They may fail, but it's good to attempt to do something of that kind. So it's our responsibility, it seems to us, that each one of us deeply understands this enormous problem for which each one of us is responsible. You have heard the speaker saying all this. He has said it all over India, Europe, in this country, in Australia and so on. You listen to all this. And apparently we don't seem to apply it. And that is really the most terrible thing to do. If you hear something that is true and not apply it, it acts as a poison. You understand? It, it, it's a very destructive thing to hear something true, natural, healthy, and not profoundly apply it. Then what you have heard and what you are what you are brings about a contradiction and then there is conflict, perpetual conflict. Be- far better not to hear any of this. 
and not a plant. The speaker has a passport, an Indian passport, diplomatic passport. But that paper does not identify himself with the country. That paper is merely for the convenience of travelling. The fourth extract is from the second question and answer meeting at Brockwood Park in 1984, titled Do your schools give students an understanding of the total human problem? Do your schools, underlined, (laughs) here or elsewhere, give the students an understanding of the total human problem? the immensity of human life and its possibilities. The question has been put to the speaker, so take, take a rest. <laughs> First of all, the speaker helped in various countries in India. There are five schools and there are going to be other schools. And there is one school here at Rockwood and one in California, at Oha. They are not the speaker's school. They are the school where not only the speaker and others have helped to bring help to bring it about. So it cannot be called your school. I know K's name is used, but it's not his personal school. And that wouldn't be correct or true. It's a school that all the schools in different parts of the world have come, have been built or come together with hundreds of people working for it. You understand? Know, it's not just one person. That would be terrible. You couldn't do it. There are schools in India that have existed for over 60 years, which we helped to, the speaker helped to bring it about with the help of others. One in the north, near Benares, and, near, and the other in the south, near Madras, and so on. And, that's it. and there's one here, and one in California. Teach educators so like you and me, they are human. They have their own personal problems, their own difficulties. And the students come already conditioned by their parents, by their neighbours, by other children, and come to these various schools. And the teachers are also conditioned unfortunately. And you're asking a question of total human understanding of life, the immensity of human existence and its vast possibilities. First of all, do the parents want this? You understand my question? 
Generally, the parents want their children to have some kind of degree, technological degree, or human degrees, you know, various degrees, so that they can get a good job, settle down in life, and marry, children carry on. Generally, what the parents want. And the children feel certain responsibility to, towards their parents, so they are more or less, especially in the Asiatic world, conform. In India, do you want to go into all this? Parents, I've met them, speaker has met them all, not most of them, in California, here. Some of them don't care a damn whether they pass examination or not, so long as the parents are relieved of their children. They send them off to boarding houses, to, you know, all that. In England too, and they hardly have any relationship except with their children, except in the summer holidays or winter holidays. And the responsibility of the educator becomes immense. And to teach them, to help them to understand the immense the immensity of human life, the vastness of existence, not only one's own personal existence, but existence, nature, the animals, the whole universe, that requires not only a capable mind, brain, <coughs> And inquiring into that, and also teaching a particular subject, you understand? Because as society now is, if you are a good engineer, you get a better, good job. So, students also want a good job. They don't want to become saleswomen or salesmen in a shop. So they want a good job. So they, their whole Concentration, if you can use that word, is to getting a good degree, A level, O level, and all the rest of it. And there is the pressure of society, which you all have created. And there is the pressure of the parents, and so on. You understand the difficulties of all this? And if you understand it very clearly, and deeply. Will you join us? Now, careful, you can't just join because you want to join. You have to do something. You have to be a good cook, good gardener, yes, good teacher, good parent. You want this. Don't leave it to us. The educator needs educating, as the parents need educating, so do the students. It's a, it's a process of living, working, cooperating, feeling together, not battling with opinions. And this requires a great deal of energy. And which parent? And there are many parents. At Brockwood School, I believe there are 15 to 90 nationalities. And that school 
this school is not what it should be, but it will be. We are working for it. Help us. You understand? I am not asking you money. That that's easy stuff. <laughs> but join together to create something to, together. The fifth extract is from a public discussion in Ojai, 1975, titled Can Teachers and Students Uncondition Themselves? Are you saying, sir, in a school, both the educator and the educated are conditioned? Wait, wait, take it. I have been at this game for 50 years, sir. I have helped to form several schools in India. This has been one of the major problems, how to deal with the parent who is conditioned, the child, the children also conditioned, because they live with their parents, with the society, with their group, and the teacher is also conditioned. So, conditioned in the sense they are prejudice, they are violent, they are nationalistic, class conscious, rich and the poor, you know, the, the, the Hindu, the Muslim, the Christian condition. Now, how to deal with this problem? Both, both at home, both in the school. That's a question we have to dis- we are discussing now. You are a teacher, I am the student, I'm the child. You realize your condition, you are aware of your condition. And I, the student, I'm not I'm not aware of it. Because I'm still too young, too I'm being conditioned by the TV, by the magazines, and so on, so on, by my friends. Now, how will you deal with this? Just first look at it. How will you deal with this problem? You are conditioned, and the student is conditioned, your child is conditioned, and the teacher is conditioned, the educator. Now, in a school, we have tried this, that's why I'm talking about it. In the school, the teacher and the student are both conditioned. For the teacher to wait till he is unconditioned, might just as well till the rest of his life. So the question is then, can he and the student in their relationship in a school uncondition themselves? You follow the problem? That is, in teaching, or before giving certain facts about mathematics and so on, discuss this problem, talk it over with the student. Look, I am conditioned and you are conditioned. And explain all the complexities of conditioning, the result of that conditioning. Show him the picture, the real picture, not your fanciful picture, your imaginative picture, but the actual picture of a human being's condition as a Jew, as a Muslim, as a this or that. They are at each other's head. I would discuss this problem and have a dialogue, uh, go into this with the student every day. As part of the school work, then the teacher begins to uncondition himself and the student at the same time. So, the teacher and the student have to establish relationship. 
That means a relationship not of one who knows and the other who doesn't know. He sits on a platform and he there I'm sorry, here there is no platform. <laughs> so the establishment of right relationship between the teacher and the student is imperative. And the teacher has the responsibility. He's dedicated to this. And the parent is not because he's got to go to the office. You follow? He hasn't time. The, the wife hasn't time either. The mother. So the teacher has be, the educator becomes tremendously important. He is the highest profession in society. The final extract in this episode is from Krishnamurti's fourth talk in Sanan, 1974, titled Can We End Violence in Our Children? How can you put an end to violence in our children, in our younger generation, younger people? Why has if I may ask, why has violence become so extraordinarily pervading, so, I mean, incredibly increasing? Why? Is it First of all, in our children, is it that the parents have no time to give to the children? Because they are so occupied with their own problems, with their earning my livelihood and so on and so on. The children have no, com- no relation between the older and the younger. Is that one of the reasons? I am not saying that's the only reason. The mother and the father go away to earn more money. And the children are sent off to schools. In the school, there's competition, there's fighting before all that's going on in modern schools. There's no relationship between the teacher and the student. There is no real deep human communication with the so-called teacher and the pupil. He is occupied with his own problems, so he cannot talk to them before the class subject begins about quietness, gentleness, living a life of goodness. You talk to them, because he is himself doing it, not just talking about it. Is that one of the reasons? And is it another reason? Pick up any newspaper, every day there is some kind of violence, wars, somebody is being killed, raped and kidnapped. It is pervasive, it is all around, this sense of violence. Why has this happened? You follow, sir? Why has this happened right through the world in these recent years? Is it a reaction to the Victorian ideals? Is it because some specialists have said, children must grow up, never be corrected, let them grow up? Don't tell them what to do. Don't punish them. You follow that? It's been also. Is it because of the recent wars? <coughs> there is so much violence all around us in the air. Is it because 
everything around us has lost its meaning. You understand? The communists, with their gods and with their philosophy, say human beings are insects. You understand, sir? To be destroyed. Millions and millions have been destroyed because they are treated like so many insects. Is that one of the reasons? Is it because the younger generation see that the older generation has not given peace to the world and therefore they must be violent too? They see everything around you, around them is a struggle, conflict, success, wanting security, success, position. You follow? All around us, this is the pattern. And we are educated to that from childhood. And don't you think that is inevitable then that this violence comes into being? And also, religion, the real, the real kind of religion, not this phony circus religion, the, the only religion which you, everybody trots out, has never said and maintained, right, don't kill. They say, kill when necessary. They have blessed the battleships, they have blessed the cannons, they have blessed the heroes, you follow? But never said, don't kill another human being. They, they, they didn't say it because they were supported by governments, property, all the rest of it. So, taking into all this into account, what is a child to do? He's sensitive, inquisitive, tender, has no affection or love at home except occasionally. He sees the parents drinking, smoking drugs and quarrelling, violent. There's the whole pattern set for him. Therefore, what is one to do? What are you to do? If you have children, what are you to do? Thank God for those who have no children at the, ti- at the present time. But for those who have, what are they going to do? So this is a tremendous problem. You understand, it's not just a morning's discussion for a half an hour to talk over it and go back to your life with violence. This requires tremendous, it is a responsibility. What are you to do? All the schools, the colleges, the universities are like this. Passing exams, competition, struggle to have a place. The fear of not having a place. You know what's happening in the communist world? If you cannot pass certain exams, you become a worker for the rest of your life. Therefore, competition is hectic. That means violence. So what will you do with your child? Will you form, will you help to create a new school? Will you undertake the responsibility with few others to create a new school? You understand? Responsible for money, for work, for everything involved in a school. Have you the energy, the interest, the care, the affection? 
And if you have not, then you will drift like the rest. If you have, and if you cannot start a school, perhaps there are other kind of schools. Help them. You follow? Give them. Go this create it. And we go we speak on with the others, we are doing we want to create a school. We are burning with it. It's our responsibility. Not just talk, talk, talk endlessly and do nothing. 